Okay, greetings everyone. My name is Mary Beth Iyer. Sorry about the delay there. Got to love computers, a little bit of technical difficulties, but we're good to go now. So I am the representative for Life Scientific. And as your host, I want to thank you all for attending this segment of Life Scientific's Lunch and Learn webinar series. We do these broadcasts once a month. So please register on your website or subscribe to our LinkedIn or YouTube page to save your seat for our upcoming live streams. The webinar live stream goes directly to your YouTube channel. It will be available for sharing and viewing on demand. Just share the link you use today and you're able to watch as many reruns as you want. Share it with anyone who would be interested in it. If you want to ask a question, please address the chat box. All comments made there will be reviewed at the end of the uh, presentation and then we can answer your questions. You can easily navigate to the chat column on your PC or smartphone as shown on this slide. Due to the codec related issues, many older browsers aren't supporting this live stream functionality anymore, but the recording will be available for watching across the device um, after it's done on video and you can get it on YouTube at the same channel. Life Scientific is based in St. Louis and was founded in 1992 to represent the manufacturers of parental production machinery. I'm based in Illinois, covering a good portion of the Midwest from aseptic environments through container integrity testing and packaging. Our company has been involved in over 5,000 equipment projects throughout the Midwest. For more information, please refer to our website. If there's any additional information or technical services we can provide, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Bonson Environmental Specialties is one of the first companies we represented in the pharmaceutical production market. Bonson was founded in 1972 and is a market leader in the design, manufacturing, installation, and servicing of a diverse line of controlled environmental chambers. They manufacture a wide range of reach-in and walk-in stability chambers, photo stability chambers, vaccine storage, and custom ultra low freezers and environmental chambers. They're based in Raleigh, North Carolina, and have services, service offices throughout the U.S. Bonson Environmental Specialties is a member of the MCOR Group, a $7.6 billion Fortune 500 company. Our presenter today is Dan Gressens with over 22 years experience with Bonson Environmental Specialties. Dan is Bonson's walk-in specialist. His role is overseeing all phases of multi-million dollar pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical con construction projects with emphasis on planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and financial control of the environmental room planning and construction. Today, Dan will explain the minimal requirements for chamber installation at your facility. This talk has turned out to become one of Bonson's regular checklists when auditing sites for chamber installations. With that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Uh, thank you, Mary Beth, and uh, thank you for having us today. Um, in my past 22, 23 years as a project manager in sales, um, I've put together a list of items that I thought is kind of important to review. Um, when I used to go out in the field and capture information when I would quote projects, and I thought this would be good information to pass along to the folks that are uh, dealing with us today. Um, first thing is or chamber installation are site factors. I have building conditions, accessibility, and loading dock final location for an existing facility. Um, I think it's very important to check uh, the building envelope, look to see what the walls, the floor foundation, and the roof look like. Um, you don't want, uh, obviously, uh, insulation hanging down from the roof or from the walls, and you don't want a, a cracked foundation uh, if you can prevent it. Another thing you need to look for is uh, floor drains because when you install environmental chamber, you're gonna need to get the condensate out of the building Another item is uh, what type of permanent power is on site. Um, most places have 460 volt, but I've seen, I've been surprised by some locations that don't have it. Um, it's important to know if there's uh, 120 volt, which there should be 208, 230 volt, and 460 volt. I also look at the uh, structural steel. I wanna make sure that the overhead building steel um, would be adequate in case we have a large chamber and we need to suspend the chamber from the building roof steel or if we put the condensing units up on a building roof. We want to know that the steel will support the weight that's being imposed by the chambers and or the condensing units. And what's the condition of the existing building HVAC system? Uh, if this uh, chamber goes into a, if it's a critical chamber with critical temperature in our age, 
and it's in a conditioned space, you want to make sure that that the uh, conditioned space will be able to be conditioned adequately enough with the existing um, building HVAC system. And of course, if you have a new building, a building should not have these issues. Uh, another item is accessibility. Uh, would the building have enough space to receive a semi-trailer? Um, I've seen in the past where we've had trucks back up down a dirt road or uh, a muddy dirt road. It's created complications. Uh, we want to check to see what the ac accessibility to the highways are. Um, that seems um, like an easy question, but um, um, it, it's it's nice to know that there's good adequate uh, transportation or roads uh, that we can have, you know, semi-trailers drive down and they're not going down some uh, one-lane highways. And what's the traffic flow? Um, especially when you have a, a, a large chamber that's being delivered to a, a large metropolitan area. Um, you're going to want to know what where the low bridges are and the overpasses. I've had experience before delivering uh, materials to a facility in downtown Boston where the truck driver didn't follow the uh, the routes that we provided to him. He on a right hand turn when he should have took a left and therefore he got stuck at a low bridge and backed up the traffic for several hours. And last on the list is loading dock to final location. Uh, what is the condition of the loading dock? What is the access from the loading dock to the chamber location? Um, it's important to know um, if you're offloading the equipment that A, you're trucking back up to it, hopefully it has an articulated lift, and B, um, we want to make sure that the, the equipment can get through uh, the hallways and the door openings that are on site. And lastly, what equipment is needed to offload the materials? Would we need hoists, lulls, and forklifts? That would be important to know ahead of time. On the chamber installation, um, what I've outlined here is the location of the chambers, the condition space, is a semi-conditioned warehouse, and pretty much the location of where the chambers are within a building, uh, floor drains, floor levelness, and permits. Um, one thing to consider is, are the chambers going to be located in a cool, dry place? That would be excellent. If it's located in a conditioned space, it'd be nice to know. You should be aware of what the temperature and relative humidity ambient conditions are so we could accurately calculate the heat loads. If it's located in a semi-conditioned space, we would need the temperature and RH again for the heat load calculations. If a chamber is being located outside, we would need the temperature and the RH for the area that is being located, the town, the city. ASHRAE 90% would have that information. And one thing to consider if you're putting it outside, the chamber is going to have a greater moisture infiltration. You'll need a membrane sloped roof. Probably need some structural steel to support the roof. And uh, the floor slab. Uh, will have to be considered as well. Other chamber location, uh, locations, um, be mindful if you're out in an uh, area near the ocean to be uh, not below sea level. I've had a customer that was actually below sea level in New Orleans and their entire um, environmental chamber operation was flooded. Um, other locations would be the ground floor if it's located on the first floor, we'd want to know the size of a freight elevator or if we have access to stairs, if we've got to go anything above the first floor. And if it's located on a you know, 10th floor or above, um, I'd want to know if a crane would be required to boom the equipment up to the uh, higher floors. Um, We'd also want to know uh, the condensate drain line locations. Um, these are easily forgotten and most often forgotten, and they, be, they can become problematic to install after the fact. So uh, that's something I always like to get up front. 
and the floor levelness should be about a quarter inch and in 10. So you'd want to make sure that the floors are level. And last but not least, our permits. Um, we should find out what's involved in obtaining the electrical and mechanical permits. I don't know if anybody on the line is from California, but uh, California has a Title 24, um, which sometimes require PE sealed and stamped drawings, which can be a huge drag on time and be expensive as well. The next thing is a chamber purpose. A working lab, uh, we'd want to know the number of occupants, temperature and RH levels, and any makeup air requirements so we can calculate the heat loads. Uh, the stability storage is this, or excuse me, storage chamber. Uh, need to know if it'd be for a stability storage, cold chain storage or freezers, and would need to know what the temperature and RH levels would be for that. And if it's a test chamber, would like to know what's being tested and what the temperature and relative, relative humidity ramping rates would be. And if it is a plant growth chamber, we'd need to know the light levels and micromoles, temperature and RH, shelving layout, and airflow sensitivity. Each one of these items have more issues that we would pull out of it, but these are just global issues for the conversation. Uh, the dry room, how low is the RH? What type of dryer would be needed? Would it be a gas or electric? And the location of the dryer, would it be indoors or outdoors? Um, we'd want to keep the dryer as close to the chamber as possible to minimize the amount of ductwork and eroding of ductwork either inside or outside because that gets expensive. And the long-term ultra-low storage, if you're using minus 70, minus 80 freezers, then you want to convert it to a, a, a walk-in style. We would need to know the total cubic feet of storage for the minus 70 or 80. Types of redundancy, if LN2 is required, and we need the location of the cascade skids and power requirements. Under special requirements, 100% um, mechanical redundancy. We'd like to know if your operation would require 100% mechanical redundancy, which basically is doubling up on the condensing units and the internal evaporators, and or we would have another approach, which is dual circuited coils with shared fans. So we'd like to know what um, redundancy would apply to a certain situation. And if there are any controls redundancy uh, that is required. Uh, controls redundancy is, I wouldn't say that popular, but um, it's been requested and it can get expensive. So we need to drill down on, on what exactly is required. Uh, like the, for LN2, need to determine if LN2 is required. And if it is, who's, a, who's providing it? how much is required, and who's installed in the vacuum jacketing pipe. This is a clean room or classified chamber. What is the classification of the room? Is it uh, uh, class 100? I'm using the old standards, class 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000. Is it a warm room? Is it a cold room? Or is it a freezer? And if it's an explosion safe environment, what's being stored? What is the rating? and the electrical classification of the materials that are in there. Is that class one, division one? Or is that class one, division two? And for special atmospheres, we'd like to know if there are any corrosive gases, caustic vapors, or things like that. And if the site insurance carrier is FM factory mutual, we'd like to know that because if you're an FM factory mutual site, they're gonna mandate certain panel uh, compositions, steel and stainless steel panels would be needed, not aluminum because aluminum melts quicker in a fire. And they also require us to install the field batten strips along every seam within the chamber to hold the chamber together in the event of a fire. Um, under chamber characteristics, chamber size, how large will a chamber need to be? Um, Another thing that is often forgotten is when these chambers are installed, if you can imagine uh, like a uh, 
U-shaped configuration and the chamber is going into an existing space, we need at least one inch clearance going all the way around the walls to maintain um, an airspace so the chambers don't sweat. Uh, what is the overhead clearance for installation of any con uh, air-cooled, water-cooled condensers that would go on top of the chambers and any humidifiers and desk and dryers that would go on top of the roof of the chamber? Um, what are the product loads? Uh, we would need to know the uh, pounds of product and entering temperature. What equipment is operating in the chamber? Um, we would need to know all, any type of um, electrical appliance that is hooked up and running within the chamber or plans to run in the chamber because uh, these loads can turn out to be quite large. And we'd want to know what the soft loads would be, uh, like the number of occupants that are going into the chamber, how often they're going in, and if there's any makeup there that's required for the personnel, there probably would be if there's going to be occupants in there. Um, another thing is uh, ventilation requirements. If the chambers are occupied, uh, we would need to know um, if it's going to be 15 to 20 CFM per person and what the temperature and relative humidity of that uh, makeup there would be. Um, and I'm just going to emphasize one more time, the loads are very important. Uh, that translate to a sizing the equipment correctly. So um, very important to have that accurate information up front. Chamber temperatures, you're going to want to know if it's a 4 degree C, 25 C, 30, 40 C, or something else. Uh, uniformity, uh, we want to know uh, the chamber uniformity, if it's plus or minus 1 degree volumetric or 2 degree volumetric or something other than that. We're going to want to know what the humidity uh, uh, of the chamber is going to be, whether it's like a 25% or lower chamber, 30%, 60 75% or something other. And we'll also want to know what the volumetric uniformity of the humidity would be. Is it going to be 3% or is it going to be 5%? It could be a max range of like uh, no greater than 65%, so that would be helpful. And another thing to consider are future operating ranges of the chambers. Uh, a lot of times I'll have people ask, uh, I need a 2560, a 3065, or a 4075 chamber. And I always respond, well, instead of three chambers with those three conditions, can we provide one condition that will do all those conditions? And uh, yes, we can. Let's see, um, chamber humidity and dehumidification. Uh, what we'd want to know here is how much and what type of water is available, whether it's RO water or DI or building water for humidification. What is the water quality on site? Usually we require about 15 meg ohm or less. Is there a water purification system required? And if so, who would be providing it? And for uh, dehumidification, we want to know would it be for mildew control only? Or would it be a desiccant dehumidification for de greater depressed levels beyond like 65%? Do you need a 50%, 40, 30? Uh, we have some customers that have it less than 1%. And compressed air. How much air is uh, on site? Let's see, condensing unit types. We would need to determine where the condensing units will reside. Um, that's a big factor because um, the further away from the chamber, the greater the costs are. And the condensing unit types would be indoor air-cooled on top of the chamber. Um, that's quite popular. It's a great approach, but it puts the heater ejection directly right back into the building. So that's something to think about. Another approach is outdoor air-cooled. This is another great approach. Um, it can get expensive depending on where the condensing units are located. If we have uh, very uh, long pipe runs and if it's union labor, it gets expensive to do those installations. So to keep these things close coupled to the chamber is very paramount. Indoor water cooled is a great approach on top of the box. And chilled water would be another uh, very good approach if you have multiple chambers on a project. And lastly, floor types. Uh, we offer anywhere from two to four to six inch foam panels for the floors. 
or um, the client can have for a freezer, minus 20 freezer, they can provide a heated, insulated, uh, ventilated floor slab. Uh, for cold rooms and warm rooms um, on, uh, on grade, you gotta be conscientious about thermal breaks. If it's a cold room, uh, you're gonna wanna put a thermal break on the center line of the panel around uh, where the chamber resides. That is a, a thermal break is a quarter inch wide by three and a half inch saw cut water actually goes in to the gap, the condensation and evaporates. Um, if it's going to be a, uh, a foam panel, a four or six inch foam panel, you need to know how much weight is going to be imposed on a floor. Uh, these panels are typically rated for about 600 pounds per square foot uniform load not a rolling load, all right? Um, these floors will not support the weight of a, uh, a forklift truck, but we can reinforce the floors with diamond tread or um, nylon uh, little pylons, if you will, that are inserted into the floor panels and will support about 5,000 pounds per square foot. And the last thing on my list is building power. How much power is required uh, for your operation or for the building? Uh, how much um, power is going to be required for the chamber power? Um, a lot of times during the, the quoting and budgeting phases, and that's not known for chamber utilities, but we can provide that information. Um, need to know if the 120 uh, or 208, 230 volt single phase or three phase, again, would be required for the chamber or it's gonna be a single 460 uh, feed to the chamber. And then as far as backup power and EGEN, how much power is required for building backup or for the environmental chamber backup? That's all I have, Mary, uh, Mary Beth, you still there? Mary Beth? I am here. Do you, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. I'm sorry. I've been, I'm having some computer problems today, but yes, I am still here. And we actually have some questions that came up while you were talking. So um, okay. it's a two part question. And the first part is um, the guy states, we currently, we currently bacterial, I guess do bacterial research, have a bacterial research lab for seed germination. We store our research samples at ultra low temperature freezers to maintain integrity and structure. We recently expanded in the plant hormones field and plant incubator slash environmental growth chambers. What would be the ultimate suggestion relevant to growth rooms? Um, We're pondering that thought. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we would want to uh, engage in a little bit more and I don't know if we're going to do it here or on an offline call um, to find out exactly what you're wanting to do in the chamber. You know, growth chambers are very similar and we've done growth chambers before. We've done some really unique type of chambers. Um, so we would need to know what the requirements are for what you're doing regarding if you're actually growing things in there. A big difference with growth chambers versus say most of the environmental chambers that we do uh, involves lighting. You know, lighting becomes very critical in growth chambers, so we need to figure out the light levels you're going to need, um, if they're going to be constant or, or variable. Are you going to put irrigation in into the chambers? Because we would need to be able to, you know, work out the logistics of that. So a lot of it just depends on what what you're growing, or, or are you working in there, or just growing? What are you growing? What are the environmental requirements? And then, you know, we do full design and customization of chambers based around your application. So again, the, the chambers and the considerations and everything aren't that different. Um, we would just need to get more specific on what you're doing so we could really spec out the parameters for you. Okay, he has a second uh, question, which I'm, uh, based on your answer, I'm assuming we're probably gonna have to get some more information from him, but minimal size for walk-in growth chamber in terms of floor, square footage and volume. What was the first part of that idea? And he's asking mi minimal size for doing a, a walk-in plant growth chamber. Oh, I mean, more like some person. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I've seen these, you know, five by five, six by six. Okay. Yeah, Mary, yeah. And, and okay, again, so they, I would. They, they can be pretty tiny then. Yeah, yeah. They, they can be small. Okay. Exactly. You know, okay. um, I would hate to sell them a chamber that, they, you know, sure. that is too small and they outgrow their needs very quickly. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking of something. I, I saw, I've seen some very small ones. But I mean, I don't think when when you're talking price between a six by six and an eight by eight, you're not talking like a you know a fifty percent increase. I mean, you're talking slightly bigger evaporator, maybe a large, a little bit larger condensing unit, maybe a little bit more shelf and lighting. So I would err on the side of slightly bigger, so you can grow into it, sort of speak. Okay. Perfect. Well, hopefully, um, we'll reach out to him in a private conversation. Yeah, and yeah. Try to get a lot more information, like that. but hopefully that answers um, his question and, and answers the question for anyone else. You know, any yeah, other? We'd love, we'd love to have that discussion. Okay, great. Um, I think those are the only questions that we had. So, um, if that is all, then um, I guess we can go ahead and and move on and just say thanks to you guys for. Um, you know, having this presentation with us and thank everyone who attended and encourage you guys all uh, on demand viewers to register for upcoming live streams and send their comments or questions to us. On July 18th, we'll broadcast another segment of the webinar series with the newly appointed automation director at Thetagari, Mr. Massimo and I'm not sure to pronounce his last name, I think it's Gelfi. Um, Massimo will explain the fundamentals of the automation process controller, point out some key aspects and some great optional features that can be implemented to every base model. Once again, I'd like to remind you that you can check out the playlist with all of our past webinars, including this one um, from the Lunch and Learn series on our YouTube channel, and you can set a reminder for upcoming broadcast. Um, and my thanks to all attendees, to our guest presenter, and extending their knowledge on um, they're on the subject so we can um, we'll get a hold of you guys if there's any other questions if anyone uh, after watching the webinar even not the live version if you have any questions just contact us and we'll set up an appointment with um, Dan so we can um, pursue your project further thank you guys thank you thanks everybody